and welcome back for another week of lectures in our science fiction class. Uh, this week we're going to continue with new wave science fiction, uh, but a few notes to start things out. First off, I'm going to post a separate video that shows you how to turn in your research essay on our Open Lab site. Um, so um, look for that video and I'll also include screenshots to go along with that uh, that will show you step by step how to uh, get your work turned in uh, before the last day of class, uh, which is a little less than a month away. So keep that on your radar. Now for today's lecture, um, I'd ask you to read James Tiptree Jr.'s The Women Men Don't See, Samuel R. Delaney's I and Gamora, and also watch uh, one episode of Star Trek, the original series, uh, titled The City on the Edge of Forever. Now, what I, I still want you to keep to the reading schedule, but in today's lecture, I'm only going to talk about Delaney and Star Trek, um, because I want to keep things more, still on that very new wave focus. And then I'm going to pick up James Tiptree Jr., or uh, by her real name, Alice B. Sheldon, in our next lecture, uh, which is going to be on feminist science fiction. Um, so go ahead in your summaries and go ahead and write about uh, Tiptree's story, Delaney's story, the Star Trek episode, and the lecture, uh, or you can save it for next week. Either way is fine. As long as you hit on it in one of those two places, uh, I'll be happy. So for today's class, continuing new wave science fiction, and I'll be talking about Delaney and uh, the original Star Trek series. So uh, Samuel R. Delaney is originally from Harlem, and uh, he was born in 1942, still alive. And he's an extremely influential African-American and gay writer of science fiction. His writing ability and his self-taught expertise on linguistics and literary theory led to his teaching writing and literature at major universities since 1988. He recently retired from Temple University in Philadelphia, and he was a keynote speaker for the second annual City Tech Science Fiction Symposium in 2017. And in this photo, you can see him standing in the middle of the City Tech Science Fiction Collection, which uh, was right after the symposium. Now, a little bit about uh, Delaney before uh, we get into the story. So some of uh, Samuel R. Delaney's critical works include The Jewel Hinged Jaw, Notes on the Language of Science Fiction from 1977, The American Shore, Meditations on a Tale of Science Fiction from 1978, and Starboard Wine, More Notes on the Language of Science Fiction from 1984. And the thing about these critical works is that they are as insightful as they are rigorously argued. Um, he's a very, very strong uh, literary as well as science fiction critic. Um, so there's a lot we can learn from him, not just in terms of the stories he tells, but also in what he has to say about the science fiction genre in general. Now, while Samuel R. Delaney, and I guess I should note, make sure you are writing his whole name out. Like, make sure you remember uh, his name is Samuel R., middle initial R, Delaney. Um, it's important with all the different writers that we're talking about that we respect the way that uh, they present themselves. Um, and, you know, this is the way that his works are signed. So, while Samuel R. Delaney has written short fiction, uh, like what we read for today's class, what's unusual is the fact that his first science fiction work was a novel, The Jewels of Aptor, 1962. Uh, most writers tend to get into the genre by writing short fiction first before they write a longer work like a novel, but with Delaney, he jumped feet first into the deep end uh, with that science fiction novel in 1962, The Jewels of Aptor. Now, many of his stories share these characteristics. The first is the main characters usually have physical or psychological damage of some sort. Two, Delaney highlights the social background of stories in colorful detail. So it's not just about the characters, the technologies, but the social situation, the social environment, the culture is really important to the storytelling. Third, mythology is important. And the mythology could be something existing 
uh, within the story or something that emerges from the story. Fourth, communication, linguistics, and language. Communication, linguistics, and language. Uh, notably, Delaney believes that our perception of reality depends on our language. That all of this, uh, in terms of you know, what we say, how we say things, what meanings does what we say have to in our minds, uh, and also in what we write, uh, has to do with uh, what we call semiotics, S-E-M-I-O-T-I-C-S. -E and so Delaney is, is, is very cognizant of how important language is both to the way that we communicate with one another, the way that we think about the world, uh, and how our languages shape our understanding of the wor world. Um, and this is something like, you know, if you were to take my uh, English 11, I mean, 1710 Introduction to Language and Technology class, uh, we talk a whole lot about in terms of the, the interplay between language uh, and our technology and how they affect one another and obviously how they affect us. Uh, not just in terms of how we're able to communicate with one another, but how it changes the way we think. Fifth characteristic is that uh, it explores cultural difference and the social construction of identity. His fiction explores cultural difference and the social construction of identity. And what this means is that it's not just about uh, you know, trying to create some sort of a culture. He shows how there are you know, different cultures and subcultures within a world, um, how uh, the different characters are going to, you know, come together from those different backgrounds, from those different cultures, and also being, you know, recognizing of the fact that our identities are socially constructed. They're, they're constructed by, um, you know, the society in which we find ourselves, the people that we interact with, um, the culture that, you know, seeps into uh, our minds. Uh, through you know all our different senses, uh, but particularly again getting back to to language, is that these things you know construct our identities. That we we don't form an identity separate from uh, the society in which we find ourselves. And then sixth is sexuality and eroticism. Um, that you know, and this is again getting back to those characteristics of the new wave. Is like you know this acceptance of the fact that you know, science fiction is about human beings, and human beings obviously are sexual beings. Um, and for Delaney, he brings in sexuality as well as eroticism in different layers uh, into his stories. Now let's look at a, some of his different major works. So it can be argued that he has had different audiences in his career. A wide traditional readership up to and including Dahlgren, one of the works I'm going to talk about, and a narrower, perhaps more intellectual, campus-based readership thereafter. So uh, the first novel I want to talk about is called Babel 17, B-A-B-E-L-17, and this came out in 1966. It won a Nebula Award, and it reveals a notable advance in sophistication in terms of the kinds of writing that's winning these awards. Babel 17, whose chapters carry epigraphs from the work of Samuel R. Delaney's wife, who's you know early in his life, even though he identifies as gay, he was married to a woman, um, Marilyn Hacker, who is a professional poet in her own right. Um, so he has these epigraphs at the beginning of each chapter with, with, with writing from his, at that time, wife. Um, and the novel is about language, and it has a poet heroine. In a future galactic society, radio broadcasts in an apparently alien language are received. They are thought to be connected with sabotage and alien invasion. Much of the novel is to do with cracking the language, to deciphering this alien language. Then in 1967, he published The Einstein Intersection. And it's a very dense work with rich imagery. And what the story is about is that Earth has lost its humans. How is never made clear in the story. 
but their corporeal form has been taken on by a race of aliens who, in an attempt to make coherent sense of the alien artifacts among which they live, take on human traditions too. There are avatars of Ringo Starr from the uh, Beatles, Billy the Kid, as well as Christ. Uh, the hero is a black musician who plays tunes on his murderish machete. The book is a tour de force through a cryptic, though a cryptic one, since the bafflement of the protagonist trying to make sense of their transformed lives tends to transfer to the reader. Samuel R. Delaney's own diaries provide part of the text for the novel. Um, so this is something where he's working through, like the, in a sense, how do we understand culture? And if you think about like how we look at cultures of the past through anthropology, you know, we find their tools, we find their buildings, we find things that have been left over uh, after they've gone. And in this case, if humanity's gone and these aliens, you know, find our artifacts, our remnants, in order to fully understand or better understand as they take on our own forms. Um, and it, it, in a sense, you know, um, makes sense. In the sense, like, if you need to, you know, type on a, a keyboard, if your, if your bodily existence is, like, let's say, lots of tentacles, it may not be as wieldy as if you were to have, like, human-like hands in which you could then type at the keyboard. Um, so in, in, in these ways, and there's that one way, you can imagine bigger ways in which being human, having on a human body form, allows you to interface um, in some way with that... Um, culture and its artifacts. Now in 1975 he published um, at least in my opinion like you know, his masterwork Dahlgren D-H-A-L-G-R-E-N and Dahlgren is what we would call a very postmodern novel. It's very controversial and there's as probably as many people that, that dislike it as like it. But it was a bestseller. It has a very long book. And um, what it's about is an anonymous youth known only as the Kid comes to the violent, nihilistic city of Bologna, where order has fled and there are two moons in the sky, though the rest of this near-future USA are apparently normal. He becomes an artist, um gets into fights, and writes a book that might be Dahlgren before leaving the city. And so in a sense, the novel is self-reflexive. The opening sentence completes the unfinished final sentence, and which is like this enigmatic circle. It is a book primarily about the possibilities and difficulties of a youth culture, and partly about being a writer. Now, this is, a, as I said, a postmodern work of fiction. Now, what do I mean by postmodern? Modernity, M-O-D-E-R-N-I-T-Y, is roughly the period beginning with the Enlightenment through the Industrial Revolution to the Second World War. Modernity focused on grand narratives, or big ideas, that were considered universal. One of these is the liberal humanist idea of identity or a centered self. Postmodernism follows and overlaps the end of modernity, and it is characterized by an array of cultural theories and attitudes that have developed as skepticism colored with irony, emphasizing language and power relationships toward long-standing Western universalized theories and beliefs including the theory of human progress, the power of reason and rationality, objective reality, and the human. Modernism had already brought into question many of these issues, especially concerning the human as center of the self and of the world, but postmodernism extends and critiques these earlier reformulations. Delaney, uh, Harlan Ellison, who I talked about in our last uh, lecture, and other new wave science fiction writers are also in, in many ways considered postmodern writers. It is during the postmodern era that we see slippages between science fiction and mainstream literature. For example, Thomas Pynchon, 
P-Y-N-C-H-O-N, one of the most highly regarded mainstream literary writers, almost always has science fictional elements, jokes, and intertextual allusions in his work, but you will not find his books in the science fiction section of the bookstore. So that brings us to uh, what you have read uh, for today's class, I and Gamora. So I and Gamora is another story uh, is, is a story influenced by particle physics and the effects of radiation on the human body. In the story, spacers are astronauts who are neutered before puberty so that their reproductive organs are not damaged by cosmic rays and hard radiation in outer space. This connects to ideas from the early days of the space race in the 1950s and 1960s. Is it easier to construct spacecraft in spacesuits that protect astronauts, or is it easier to adapt human beings to the environment of space? Cyborgs, or assemblages of human and machine, first took form during this era in response, at least in part, to these debates. Returning to the story, there are some unmodified humans who are fetishists, who desire spacers, despite the fact that they are androgynous and lack sexuality. These fetishists are called frocks, F-R-E-L-K-S. The spacers prostitute themselves to the frocks, both as a joke on the frocks as well as a loneliness or lack of attraction to others. The story shows how technological interventions in the body can have unintended consequences for those whose bodies are altered as well as the change in culture around those altered bodies. All right, so now that brings us to Star Trek. And again, just remember that uh, with James Citry Jr., we're going to talk about her work in next week's um, lecture. So with Star Trek, uh, the original series was on NBC from 1966 to 1969. And it was created by Gene Roddenberry. G-E-N-E -E Roddenberry, R-O-D-D-E-N-B-E-R-R-Y. And get a picture up here to company. There we go, there's Star Trek. Uh, Gene Roddenberry lived from 1921 to 1991. Now, Roddenberry had an interesting life before he came to create Star Trek. He was a pilot during World War II. Then he became a commercial airline pilot. And uh, after that, he became a police officer for a while. He left the LAPD to become a full-time TV writer. And two of the, the key components of Roddenberry's uh, outlook uh, on life and the universe and everything is that he was a humanist, which means that he believed that everything, um, in a sense, revolves around humanity, that it, you know, what we want to accomplish is up to human beings to do. And he was also an agnostic. An agnostic is someone who, um, in a sense, acknowledges the existence of a higher power, but doesn't ascribe to any particular religion. So Gene Roddenberry pitched Star Trek as a wagon train to the stars. Wagon Train was a long-running Western TV series about the Western expansion following the Civil War. So it's about ideas of exploration, moving into uncharted areas, in this case, instead of moving into the uncharted West, where indigenous peoples lived, here we're moving out to space, where there are alien species that have their own civilizations on other planets. The opening narration, I think, is important for us to think about. So this narration is at the beginning of each episode of Star Trek. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's five-year mission to explore strange new worlds to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. From this opening, 
we learned that this is a space opera. Set in space, there's a frontier, you go to new worlds, meet new aliens, and go where no man has gone before. But importantly, in 1987, with the debut of Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, the phrase was changed to where no one has gone before. Because obviously, um, while in the past man was used to indicate humanity, um, this is, isn't an acceptable term for us to use today, and so it was brought into no one. Now, let's see, there's one, two, three, four, five, six general characteristics of Star Trek that I want you guys to know about. First, is that it was a socially progressive and optimistic television series about the future. Socially progressive and optimistic about the future. Second, it blends the fantastic with the familiar. It blends the fantastic with the familiar. And this in turn makes its exoticism manageable and unthreatening. So while it is a spaceship out um, in the stars, uh, there's a lot of aspects to it just in terms of like language, the way people interact. Um, some of the settings are very Earth-like. Makes it familiar to us while at the same time being a little bit different, but not so much so that it's really strange to us. The third characteristic is social criticism of the here and now and moral lessons safely veiled, V-E-I-L-E-D, veiled in science fiction. Social criticism of the here and now and moral lessons safely veiled in science fiction. For example, the first interracial kiss on scripted American television was in an episode of Star Trek in 1968. And so to give you a little context, the groundbreaking Civil Rights Act of 1964 had only passed a few years prior. And it was only one year prior, 1967, that the Supreme Court ruled in Loving v. Virginia that laws prohibiting interracial marriage were invalid. In Season 3's uh, episode titled Plato's Stepchildren, in 1968, Captain Kirk and Lieutenant Uhura are made to kiss by super beings. The studio ordered two cuts filmed, one kissing and one not. But Roddenberry was insistent that they show the kiss, so Shatner and Nichols ham it up in every non-kiss take so that they had to run the take with the kiss. Essentially, they screwed up the ones that where they weren't kissing. There were concerns about offending stations in the Deep South, and there, and there were uh, some that refused to run the episode. The fourth characteristic. It's formulaic. Like each individual episode is kind of formulaic. It has certain beats that it follows. And you have a beginning, and you're going to have a middle, and you're going to have an end. And this is opposed to the cliffhangers that we used to see in what? The film serials, uh, like in Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. Um, now, this has changed, obviously, today, where most modern um, TV shows, especially streaming shows, um, aren't you know, formulaic, self-contained individual episodes. They often have some sort of continuity, so the story is to told over episodes, and you will have cliffhangers. So there's kind of like this return to that older style of storytelling. And it built audience engagement, get people to come back much more. The fifth characteristic is alien super beings. Alien super beings. So in a sense, humanity in the series might have starships, but they are essentially the new kids on the block. That essentially these other alien races have been around much longer, have had much more time to evolve, have more powerful and interesting technologies than we have. Um, and so it's not to say like, you know, just because we have spaceships and we have these new technologies that we're all powerful. And Roddenberry's, you know, I think it's important to remind us that we're not. And then the last characteristic is that it is scientifically lax, L-A-X, scientifically lax, meaning that scientifically not always that accurate. 
that it suffers from, in particular, a term that we call technobabble. Uh, and you should definitely know this term. T-E-C-H-N-O-B-A-B-B-L-E, technobabble. And what this is, is you take um, technical and scientific terms and you combine them together in ways that evoke the rhetoric of science and technology, but don't necessarily um, either work together or explain in, in reality what is taking place or what's going on. Let's see, so I'll talk a little bit about the crew of the Enterprise and talk a little bit about some of the New Wave writers who wrote for the show and then we'll talk about the episode that you watched. So the crew of the USS Enterprise is that is first we have Captain James T. Kirk, James Tiberius, T-I-B-E-R-I-U-S, Kirk, played by William Shatner, shown over here on, on the left. And then we have his, his um, counterpart, his good friend in the show, Mr. Spock, played by Leonard Nimoy, um, who is uh, an original creation for the show uh, being half human and half Vulcan. Then some of the other principal characters are Dr. McCoy, played by DeForest Kelly, who has like this southern gentleman uh, air about him. We have Mr. Sulu, uh, played, played by George Takei, Japanese-American. Scotty, uh, who's the engineer of the Enterprise, is played by James Doohan. Um, an interesting thing about James Doohan, uh, he's a Canadian, and he took six bullets uh, following D-Day from f friendly fire. Uh, four shots went in the leg, one in the chest, and one in his hand. Uh, a silver cigarette case stopped the chest shot, um, but he had to have his right middle finger amputated. So if you notice in the show, just as a bit of trivia, he's usually hiding uh, in some way or knuckling over um, his right hand so that you can't see that one missing finger. Then we have uh, also on the bridge crew Ensign Chekhov, played by Walter Koenig, uh, who portrays a Russian. And again, this is getting to the multicultural, like uh, utopianism of the show, that uh, in the future that Earth would be a unified planet, that there wouldn't be a division between the West um, and the East in terms of like you know the Western democracies and then communism in Russia. Uh, the USSR. And then clo closing out the, the bridge uh, crew, we have Lieutenant Uhura, played by Nichelle Nichols. And as I mentioned before, Kirk and Uhura's on-screen kiss in 1968 was the first interracial kiss on American TV. Also notably, after the first season, Nichols wanted to leave the show for Broadway, but she re received a very special phone call from a really big Star Trek fan, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He convinced her of her importance uh, and her character's importance uh, to people of color who looked up to her, and uh, she helped keep the door open for future opportunities for people of color, so she decided to stay on the show after that phone call. Now, uh, one of the neat things about Star Trek uh, is that many of the episodes were written by uh, new wave science fiction writers, um, and it, so it had a big influence. New Wave had a big influence on Star Trek. Uh, the first and second seasons were the strongest, uh, most budget uh, to hire top science fiction writers, including Jerome Bixby, who co-wrote the story that was turned uh, into the film uh, Fantastic Voyage in 1966. We got Robert Block, uh, who wrote science fiction and horror, and well known as the novelist who wrote Psycho in 1959, which was then filmed a year later by Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, Harlan Ellison, uh, who we talked about last time and who uh, wrote the episode that we watched for today. Uh, there's Richard Matheson, who's famous for writing the book I Am Legend in 1954. Uh, it, got turned into the film Will Smith, uh, amongst one of its adaptations. Uh, Norman Spinrad, who's famous for writing Bug Jack Barron, uh, which was serialized in New Worlds in 1969. Uh, and also Theodore Sturgeon, 
uh, who wrote More Than Human, published in 1953. So a lot of new wave science fiction influence into Star Trek. So in today's episode, The City on the Edge of Forever, uh, broadcast in 1967, we see the ambiguity that I say makes good SF. The original script was penned by Harlan Ellison, but his script was watered down by the series' stable of writers to accommodate studio demands for the show's perceived audience. I'd like you to think about how this show bridges the new wave uh, to a more popular audience. We have here the new wave made more palatable for a general audience. So the episode is a time travel narrative in which Bones goes into Earth's past and in inadvertently changes the future, including that of the Enterprise and its crew. Kirk and Spock must travel into the past to correct what Bones did. But correcting the changes requires Kirk to sacrifice a woman, Edith Keeler, who he had begun to fall in love with. It raises questions of ethics and causality. Um, and this is probably, at least in my opinion, one of the best Star Trek episodes uh, from the original series. So uh, that's it for today's lecture. Uh, I'll have office hours this Wednesday from 5 until 6. Um, I'll post that Google Hangout link to our Open Lab site as I've done before. Some of you guys have been taking advantage of that. I appreciate it. That's what I'm there for. I want to help you guys as much as I can. If you can't make the office hours, remember to email me. My email address is jellis at cdtech.cuny.edu. Um, and if you either, you know, we can work over email or if you need to talk face-to-face uh, -face, like on video or over the phone, just let me know like when you're available and we'll figure out a time to make that work. Um, and also stay tuned for that separate video I'm going to make that shows you how to turn in your work by creating a post on our open lab site for your research essay. Uh, for the other things that's going to be coming up due such as your the final version of your notebooks uh, for all your notes, and for uh, the final exam, uh, those things I'll be talking about uh, as we get closer to the end of the semester. I know we're getting very close now, but right now I just want you focused on your research essays. Uh, remember, the, the main point of that essay is you choose a work of science fiction that we're not talking about in the class, and then you prove to me that it's science fiction. Um, and you do that by using some of those definitions of science fiction that I gave you in the beginning of the semester, uh, and you also do a little bit of research on your own using the library databases. And you can refer back to one of my past uh, lectures where I show you all the ins and outs of using the library databases. Um, if you're having trouble with that, all you got to do is send me that email. Let me know what you've already found, like what you're working on or what you're having trouble with. And then we'll take it from there. Uh, you're building a conversation to try to get you on track and get this thing, um, you know, um, the way that you want it so that both you're learning something about science fiction, you're learning something about doing research, you're learning something about writing an argument, um, and but obviously practically you know, meeting the learning outcomes from the class. Okay, So um, I'll be talking to you guys um, a, uh, asymmetrically as well as uh, symmetrically or asynchronously as well as synchronously I, I mean um, if anybody's got anything, just send me that email, jellis at cvtech.cuny.edu. See you guys later.